but we're ready. Welcome to Cram and Kirk. The photographs on the PowerPoint today are all from Cram and Graveyard, so an interesting interface with what's around us. And the key message through the hymns will be the green blade riseth. Let's begin worship as we normally do by standing as God's word enters the sanctuary. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, whether you're watching from home or you're live with us in church today. We are going to have two special announcements. These are going to be delivered by Jane and by Edith, and they're going to share these now. They're both from the official Central Church. Jane. Good morning. Matters are progressing in regard to the rationalisation of the Church of Scotland and our proposed union with the old Kirk and Muir House. And I'm required by the Presbytery of Edinburgh and West Lothian to read out the following notice. Intimation is hereby given that at a meeting to be held in Palmerston Place Church, on Tuesday, 25th April 2023, the Presbytery of Edinburgh and West Lothian will take up consideration of the report of the Presbytery Deployment Group when it will recommend that the Presbytery approve the amended Presbytery Mission Plan and, if agreed, the extract minute from the Faith Nurture Forum would be tabled for approval. If the minute is received, the 14-day review window would open. The congregation is hereby cited to attend for their interests at 7.30 p.m. in Palmerston Place Church. It is suggested that the minister, oblique interim moderator, presbytery elder plus one other should attend as representatives of the congregation by order of the Presbytery of Edinburgh and West Lothian, Dr. Hazel Hasty, Presbytery Clerk. And in shorthand, what this means is that the Presbytery plan has reached the stage where there can be a vote of approval, and if it's passed, we will be able to move forward to vote on a union with the old Kirk Muir House. Following on from what Jane has just said, um, she's saying about voting. Um, as a church, we need to have an electoral roll or register. Um, this was drawn up about six months ago, but being as that's now quite a few months almost out of date, we need to make sure it is all up to date as we come close to voting. So I'm afraid I've got another slightly long-winded notice to read out, but in essence, 
If you've got any doubt, um, I will be in the session house afterwards. Come and see me and I can check whether you're on the register or not. Notice is hereby given that in view of the anticipated union of the congregation of Cram and Kirk with the old Kirk and Muir House, the Kirk session is about to make up an electoral register. The electoral register is a list of those who will be eligible to vote when the time comes to decide upon the union. It may also serve in the selection of a nominating committee and subsequently in the election of a new minister. If your, new na if your name and current address are on the communion roll already, then you will automatically be placed upon the re electoral register. You will need to take no further action. If you are a regular worshipper here, but are still a member of another congregation, and you wish to participate in a vote by the congregation of Cram and Kirk, then you should arrange to hand in to the session clerk a valid certificate of transference before the Kirk session meets. If you're a regular worshipper here and not a member of this or any other congregation, then the Kirk session can add your name to the electoral register as an adherent. And if you wish the Kirk session to consider this, you should fill in a form available from the session clerk and complete it and return it before the Kirk session meets. If you believe you're, that your name should be on the register, you can ask for confirmation that it has been included immediately after this service by speaking to the session clerk in the session house or contacting through the Kirk office. If your name is not on the proposed electoral register and you believe it should be, you should inform the session clerk in writing before the Kirk session meets to finalize the register in Cram and Kirk Halls on Thursday the 4th of May 2023 at 7.30 p.m. You're also welcome to attend that meeting if you wish to make the case for your name to be included. As I say, if there's any confusion or uncertainty, please just be in touch with me and I'll address it. Thank you. Thanks very much to Jane and Edith. The other announcements are printed for those in church, but for those watching online, you'll see that the final of our Lenten course on West Side Story is this week. Cargillfield School have asked us to have a Sing the Spirituals evening for Christian Aid. They're going to come, Cram and Primary are going to come, and our choir are going to sing, and we hope you will come as well. Details of all our Christian Aid events are given. Always looking for people to do door-to-door -door collections. Major gas works coming up, you'll see as the final intimation, and sadly to report that Wilma Gibb, one of our members, has died, and our thoughts are with Alistair and his family at this time. Flowers today are in memory of Jim and Min Hunter, faithful members here. These are all the intimations. We worship God together in Crammond by using the psalm for today, the call to worship is printed on the screen. Michael is going to lead it for us. Let us worship God together. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. We sing together one of the great psalms, All People That On Earth Do Dwell.
Let us approach God with confidence. Let us pray together. Please be seated. Living God, when our heads are down and we have lost hope, may we see Jesus. Loving God, when we feel that we are living in a confusing and hostile world, may we see Jesus. Compassionate God, when our hands are already full and we feel unable to welcome the stranger, may we see Jesus. In silence, we say to God, what is on our hearts now. Christ calls us, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden from the self-centeredness, contradiction, and fragmentation of our lives. We turn to Christ, who is the living water, the bread of life, the light of the world. Lord, we confess that we are far from perfect. We often lack the subtle word of encouragement. We lay our lives today into the palm of your hand. You hold us, carry us, and push us when we need it. In Christ, we are offered hands, leading us to a new future, surrounding and empowering us by love, Receive his promise of forgiveness now. Help us to be released from the burdens which bind us, so that we may open the doors of our hearts with a confidence, walk into the future, surrounded by resurrection hope, all in Jesus' name. Amen. Boys and girls, last week I had to have an armed guard to protect me because the message was very controversial, and uh, fortunately I survived and I'm back for another message this week. Last week we spoke in praise of dandelions. It was very controversial. None of the gardeners liked it. This week it's much more simple. I'm going to tell you about the piece of your body that has two million working parts. Does anybody know the piece of your body, the creation God gave you, that has two million working parts? No hands went up immediately. No hands went up. It is one inch long, and it weighs a quarter of an ounce for those who still deal in imperial measure. It is your eyes. Your eyes. Your eyes have two million working parts. And some of us, some people, only have one eye working. And most of us, so over 60% of the world's population, carry some of these. They carry these because they're needed to carry glasses. When it's too sunny, we have to put on sunglasses to protect this important part of our eyes. And when we're reading... Yes, we have to put on a different set of glasses, and it can be confusing to know you've got the right set of glasses in the right place, but it always to protect this vital gift from God. And I have a challenge for everyone in church. I've taken the photographs from the graveyard for this week, but the challenge this week is to use your eyes and to come up with seven different photographs from the coming week and bring them to me next Sunday and we could use some of them in the orders of service. What do you see that really has inspired your eyes and your mind and your spirit this week? Is that a clear challenge? Have you got it? Are we willing to take it on? It is not mission impossible. Excellent. We've got the message. Okay, let's continue the service today then and see what we come up with. And it's the hymn 550, as the deer pants for the water, hymn 550.
Let us hear the word of God. The first reading is taken from the New Testament, St. Peter's first letter, chapter 1, and reading from verse 17. If you invoke as Father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. Amen.
The second reading is taken from the New Testament, St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, and reading from verse 13, the road to Emmaus. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before the Lord, and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some of the women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning. And when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near to the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he was going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. May God bless to us the reading and hearing of his holy word, and to his name be all glory and praise. Amen. We've got a special guest with us today, and I'm going to ask Biddy to come forward and to sit down so you don't have a light shining on your face. Do you want to sit there, Biddy? And, yep, you sit in that one, that's great. And we're going to have a brief conversation. Um, it's lovely to see you. you. Please tell us your name. Yep, so I'm Biddy Kelly. I'm the Managing Director at Fresh Water 
fresh start, so I'm responsible for the strategic direction and the operational day-to-day um, -day runnings of everything we do at Fresh Start. That's really helpful. And there may be some people in church, even here, who don't know the background to Fresh Start. Just give us an outline of what Fresh Start does. So Fresh Start is an um, Edinburgh-based charity that was actually established by um, Russell Barr, one of the founders, so he was one of the founders, um, and it was established by a group of different denominational churches who came together and they wanted to help people who were homeless. Um, so really we help people make a home for themselves and we do a variety of different services um, based on helping people moving on from temporary accommodation into permanent accommodation, but more recently also helping those who are at risk of homelessness as well. That is really helpful and we've had a couple of inputs from members of staff recently but again for people who don't know the climate has changed since the COVID pandemic. How has that impacted Fresh Start Biddy? We've grown dramatically. The, 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 I suppose the demand um, on our services has increased like 100%. Um, so for an, an example would be you know we generally gave out about 10,000 starter packs. We're now at 14,000 starter packs every year and it's increasing. You know, our Cookers for Christmas campaign, we, we generally give out about 100 white goods. Um, this year it's been over 200 white goods. Um, so we're seeing that the, the, the need is increasing dramatically and it's not just people who, who are on benefits, but we're seeing more people who are doing two or three or four different jobs really struggling to survive. Yes, so the need has increased. What about support for Fresh Start Biddy? Support has also increased, thankfully. Um, so we, we, we're reaching different um, avenues now. So I was just saying to Ian recently that we're, we're getting a lot of hotels and universities and student accommodation who are, are, are also supporting us with you know, big donations of, say, lots of duvies or pillows and these are the kind of things that we have to buy which actually increases our, I suppose our, our budget um, but also we've this every every Christmas as you will all know we do a cookers for Christmas campaign and um, even though we're in the midst of a cost of living crisis I'm delighted to say that we've had the most amount of money that we've ever had so generally we get about £20,000 donated um, 20,000, yeah, 20,000 pounds. Um, this year it was 32,000 pounds that people donated, um, so which will see us well into this year um, in terms of the, the amount of white goods that we have to buy, purchase for people. Yes, as we heard earlier on in, in the service, there's a plan to link the Cramond Parish with the Muir House area and the West Pilton area. Fresh Start is based in West Pilton, but you are actually involved in helping to look at the needs of the area. Tell us a little bit about the different needs and what's happening between the different groups there. Yep, so in, in North Edinburgh, during the pan I suppose two weeks prior to the pandemic, we actually established what we snappily called the North Edinburgh COVID-19 Food Share Group, um, which allowed us to work with third sector organisations, but also statutory bodies, but also the Old Kirk and Drylaw Parish as well, um, where collectively we, we gave out over a quarter of a million meals during the first lockdown. Um, so from that, what we've done is we've developed um, uh, what we call a the North Edinburgh Response and Recovery Group, which is the R squared group. So that's a group which actually um, includes the, the Old Kirk and Dry Law as well, um, and they're active partners on that. Fresh Start lead that group, um, and as it, as the name says, it's it's response and recovery. So it's it's making sure that we're responding to the needs of the local community in a in a speedy and timely manner. Um, but also that we're doing that in a collective way, in a really coordinated way, so that we're maximising the resources that we have. So we work really closely with, um, with, with, with these, I think there's about 30 plus organisations in that, but actually the Old Kirk is, is one, of, um, one of the leading lights in that. They're on the development group with myself. Biddy, we're not going to keep you too long, but I think I'm sure everybody would want to say it's really exciting to hear not only an increasing need, but an increasing response. It's exciting to hear that 
people are looking at the whole area and trying to identify needs and then collectively respond. That is most encouraging. I would like you, I'm going to ask people to give you a clap, but not for you, but for you to take back to all the volunteers at Fresh Start. It's a big organisation, it's difficult to run, it's busy, it's hectic, it asks a lot of the leaders to say thank you for all that you're doing on our behalf. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be part of that and let's continue to praise God by singing Alleluia, Alleluia. Hymn 427. We'll listen to the whole first verse and then sing together. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. In a nutshell, it was near the end of the day. At that time when most of us are tired, and when, if events have gone miserably wrong, we may be feeling flat and discouraged. We have all been there. Two travellers are plodding along the road, exchanging bitter disappointments and asking unanswerable questions of each other. 
They're joined by a third traveller who at first just seems like another ordinary guy, another run-of-the-mill human being travelling the dusty road of life. They did not recognise the stranger. Yet, as they discover in a moment of utter surprise at the close of the encounter who he is, they are reinvigorated and they end up hurrying all the way back to Jerusalem with springs in their steps, good news on their lips, and encouragement in their hearts. Maybe that's the way it has always been. Maybe that's the way it is in our experience. Christ speaks to us in ordinary situations. Christ speaks to us through ordinary people. A man I know has an alcohol problem and when he is on a binge is sometimes not able to control himself and on one occasion he was picked up by the police for doing things he shouldn't have been doing and taken into a prison cell. On the way home the taxi driver knew there was something wrong and the taxi driver said to him, I've been where you are. And I can help you if you stay off the alcohol for a period, I will take you to the AA meeting with me. Sometimes God speaks to us in the most unlikely circumstances through the most unusual people, but God always speaks to us in the same way. The second thing I want you to take from this story is about listening. As they plodded on, these two disciples, the stranger joined them and listened to them. Listened to them. The triumphant, risen, glorious Christ travelled incognito and listened to their fears, their doubts, and their tentative hopes. In our twisted way of thinking, we think that very important people do not listen to us. They want to speak with us. They want to talk at us. And there are lots of examples of that being the actual case. In this story, the evil people were the winners. Jesus, the most wonderful, graceful person they'd ever met, had been brutally executed on a trumped-up charge. Where was God? How did God allow this to happen? Why hadn't God intervened to stop the atrocity? This is what they said. We had hoped that he was the one who would redeem Israel. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, tell me about it. They did. They unburdened themselves to him. And what did he do? He listened. After they poured their hearts out, after they had got things off their chest, then he began to speak to them, for they were ready to listen themselves. And he began to weave patterns of meaning through their fractured and puzzling experience. He reminded them of the God who had worked deeds of liberation through times of slavery, suffering, and defeat. It says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them, the things concerning the Christ. Suddenly, as they walked, life did not mean meaningless. It did not seem pointless anymore. And they reflected afterwards, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us and we walked with him? And then they come to the disclosure and then they come to the point where their eyes are open. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and he broke it and he blessed it and he gave it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him before he vanished from their way. 
the divine friend who is incognito with ordinary people as they traveled on this earthly road has chosen a special place to meet where he is not incognito but strangely present and visible at a table in a recognizable way i said at the early service if i was in charge of the church and the world the one change i would make one change is to ask for the bread and wine to be available at every service every single service because no matter how good the preacher is you can't always find the word that's going to connect with the person's need in the pew but in sri lanka and in other places in sweden and america you know even if people haven't understood what you have said as they come to the table as they receive the bread and the wine their eyes are open and through their eyes being open their hearts are open and they have an encounter that touches them in a profound and deep way that's what happened on the road to Emmaus when I asked people after the Holy Week services what had touched them they all said the same two things it wasn't the monk though he was hugely impressive it wasn't the martyr it wasn't the great sermon from Alec Douglas it was meeting in a group at the Old Kirk and sharing bread and wine together with Jesus words that's what they said and coming on Sunday morning to the flagpole standing in a circle encountering each other as we shared bread and fish in a powerful way so I think that we should organize a riot we should bring a flower bomb to the next session meeting we should challenge the session clerk and the treasurer and everybody to say let's have the sacrament at every single service john knox would be for it john calvin would be for it jesus christ would be for it for he speaks to us in bread and wine through dialogue and encounter through speaking and listening that's how he speaks to you that's how fresh start works that's how the world works god has given us eyes to see if we will open them one of the ministers i respect is australian and he used to write a poem to finish each service this is his poem for this sunday we trudge on the road and the journey seems long for all becomes tiring without any song we catch up on one who has gone on ahead a stranger he seems to those who are dead he expounds the word and confounds our grief our hearts come alive with veins of belief together we dine at a roadside place at the breaking of bread out leaps easter grace we hurry back home and it does not seem long our journeys are short when singing his song thanks be to god amen
We bring ourselves to God's table now as we give our offerings, which are our lives, our time, our money, for God's use. And we stand and sing the doxology. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Ian and I will now bring our prayers for the church and the world with thanksgiving. Let us pray. Loving God, the elusive yet all sustaining one, in spite of the negative doubters around you, we dare to celebrate your glorious presence today. We give thanks for the accumulated sanity of the scriptures through which you speak to us even if our hearts feel cold. We give thanks for the caring communities of your church where you are present with encouragement, healing, and peace. We now pray for your church here and amongst our neighbours in the Old Kirk and Muir House, Davidson's Mains, Dry Law, and St Columba's Black Hall in a special way. Uplift all around the world to accept the hospitality of your table. In spite of any superficial differences between denominations, may we all be drawn closer together in outreach so that the world may see that we are disciples of the Master of Love. Teach us so to pray, loving God. Teach us so to live. Uplift your church in its attempts to serve the world. Strengthen the members who work for justice and peace. Inspire those who work for the poor and the outcast. Give encouragement to those who seek to rehabilitate drug addicts and reinvigorate those who are weary, but cannot yet seek rest from their labors. Teach us so to pray, loving God. Teach us so to live. Uplift Christians who take their place in political life in all parties, members of the government and the opposition, government ministers and backbenchers. Enable them to maintain their integrity and faith optimism amidst so much double talk and through numerous setbacks and compromises. Teach us so to pray, loving God. Teach us so to live. Uplift all the people, both within or outside the church, who this day watch with the dying, comfort the sorrowful, feed the hungry, tend the sick, befriend the loner, teach the young, counsel the bewildered, encourage the timid, and forgive the enemy. By your grace, multiply the effect of their individual efforts, that the curse of human misery may recede and the joy of living increase. All of these things we pray in Jesus' name as we say together, Our Our Father, Father, which art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy thy kingdom kingdom come, come, thy thy will be done done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. I thought you would enjoy that magnificent anthem so much that you'd want to sing those words as well. Now the green blade riseth from the buried grain. 
So the church and the world is full of change and sometimes it comes from the encounter of bread which comes from that buried grain. So we sing together this marvellous French tune, a great hymn, 417, Now the Green Blade Riseth. have heard your word, love will come again. Let us go in love to share love with those we meet, and may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us this day, and remain with us forevermore. <laughs>